Well, what's showing at the theater or what's on at the movies? We've heard these phrases in Guelph for over 130 years. Hi there, my name's Ken Irvin and I'm the Education Coordinator at Guelph Museums. And Guelph has had a really interesting and colorful history of performances, plays, music and movies. Well, where did it all start? Uh, well, some would suggest that uh, John Galt, the Scottish novelist and also known as our city's founder, he gave the first performance in swinging an axe to cut down the first maple tree. And as legend has it, his cut was followed by Tiger Dunlop, Charles Pryor, and several other woodsmen brought along for the job. John Galt wrote uh, afterwards, to me, the moment was impressive, and the silence of the woods that echoed to the sound was the sigh of the solemn genius of the wilderness departing forever. So maybe that was our first performance in Guelph. Uh, one of the first places that actual performances were held was at our first city hall that was built in 1856, which is right behind me. There was a room on the second floor above the meat market, and the meat market was on the main floor, and you can see the bull's head just behind me there too. Right above the meat market, there this was used for music and theater and recitals and town meetings as well. Uh, there was even a dressing room for the performers. Uh, but this location was not ideal as the train tracks ran right behind the building and the trains always seemed to blow their whistles while the performances were at their peak. Uh, in the year 1875, an addition was built onto the back of the building and you can see that just over to the side. And this increased the size of the meat market and the theater above it. Uh, the room was still not ideal for theater as the floor was flat and the stage was a little bit too high for the audience to see it properly. So not great. But uh, the next theater was uh, built in 1866 and it was actually part of the drill hall, which is just around the corner. And this was used for group meetings and dances and some shows, but it fell into disrepair after only about 20 years. By 1883, the need for a theater or a larger meeting hall was becoming really more evident. Uh, there was a lottery held to raise funds for a theater with a washing machine as the grand prize. Uh, and the lottery was held, the prize was awarded, but there was really very little done about a theater. Uh, about 10 years later, a workers' organization called the Ancient Order of United Workmen, they were looking for a larger hall to hold their meetings. They formed a committee to investigate the building of a meeting hall and an opera house. Within two weeks, the committee reported back to a mass meeting and they brought in an architect from Peterborough to look for the best site downtown. But once the site was chosen, the committee was instructed to make the best deal for the site. Building shares were offered at $10 each. And they had big plans. They wanted a hall for meetings, plus five stores of good depth, and an opera house at the rear of the building. Uh, Harry Powell, an architect from Stratford, drew up plans, which were then displayed at some downtown storefront windows. And by July of 1893, a board of directors was appointed. And the agent order of United Workmen were actually no longer the driving force behind building the opera house. A site at the top of Wyndham Street, across the street from the new Wellington Hotel, was selected, and you can see it in the picture here. Uh, on January 1st of 1894, the site was purchased for $7,000. There were 14 shareholders, and some of them included the more notable figures of Guelph, uh, such as William Bell of the Bell Piano Organ Factory, Alexander Petrie from Petrie's Pharmacy, and William Kennedy, stonemason and builder in Guelph. Uh, $15,000 was subscribed and collected fairly quickly. Uh, the building was to be 100 feet long and 57 feet wide and 44 feet high. Construction progressed right away and stage fittings and scenery were purchased from uh, a company in Chicago. And in under a year, the Opera House was ready to open. Total cost, including the land, was $38,000. Maximum capacity for the building was 1,222 people. The first theater manager and leasee was Albert Tavernier. And he came from a theatrical family and had spent 17 years in theater. And we have a picture of him here. His touring company uh, performed in Guelph the year before the Opera House opened. So he knew that there was potential for employment here in Guelph. On opening night, he stated, I trust and believe that I will be able to win the confidence of the theater goers of Guelph and vicinity so that the Opera House will be thoroughly well patronized. I promise you that every attraction appearing on the Guelph stage will, to the best of my knowledge and belief, be worthy. And if by mischance something not just up to the mark should creep in, please impute it to an error of judgment solely and let the excep exception prove the rule. So the first performance uh, in Guelph was a comic opera called Athenia. And the lo local newspaper reviews gave it some praise 
and they said that it had sparkles of genuine merit. Uh, the opera company actually adapted the play to include a few Guelph local references, and they actually sang this in their opera. And I'm not going to sing this because I appreciate my audience too much, but uh, the, what they said was, if in the city hall I tried to sing this song for, to you, I'd have to drown the music of a grand trunk train or two. And if I hadn't steam power lungs and throat well lined with brass, the audience might sing to me the chorus, let it pass. So Tavernier brought in many and varied shows to the opera house. Well, most of them were touring companies who performed Shakespeare or comedies or melodramas, as well as hosting local theater productions and local musical group performances. And here's a picture of the Mikado put on by the Guelph Opera Company. The price of a ticket ranged from 25 cents for the cheaper seats to 75 cents for the box seats. Uh, most shows brought in between 150 to 200 dollars in ticket receipts, uh, with the Opera House normally getting between 30 to 40 percent of sales. Although the bigger stars demanded a bigger portion of the gate. Tavernier calculated that he needed to make about $65 a night to make the theater profitable. Well, unfortunately, the Opera House was not profitable as there were not enough regular theater goers amongst Guelph's population of about 12,000 people. After two years, the theater was just not covering costs, so Tavernier left to seek his fortunes elsewhere. Uh, the opera company's directors then took over running the theater, and as time passed, the directors left the theater one by one until only uh, J.C. Kelleher uh, was in charge, and when he passed away, his wife Elizabeth had to take over. Uh, then she had the house manager, whose name was William Mahoney, take over the bookings, but he really didn't know much about theater bookings, so he sourced it out to a Toronto booking agency. And after several more unsuccessful managers, the Opera House was leased to the Griffin Theatre Amusements Corporation in 1911. Uh, they changed the name of the theatre to the Griffin Opera House. And in 1923, the building was then leased to Paramount Theatres, who renovated the building, uh, removing the second balcony and the stage boxes. And here you can see a picture of the interior. After renovations, it was called the Capitol Theatre, uh, where movies and live entertainment could be seen. And in 1953, the theater was torn down by contractor Joe Wolfland, and Simpson's Theater, Simpson Sears was built on the site. Uh, and the stone from the demolition of the Opera House was then used uh, by St. Andrew's Church to build an education wing for the church. There were other theaters that came and went in the downtown. In 1900, the Wonderland Movie Theater was established on a large property on Carden Street, where the Queen's Hotel was once located. Uh, the theatre wasn't very big, but it did have a penny arcade and the walls were painted with waterfalls and forest landscapes. It was at the time of uh, silent movies and there was live music played to accompany the film. And during the intermission, pianist uh, Albert Kayser played while the film was being re rewound. Then a few years later, on the west side of Lower Wyndham Street, the Coliseum Theatre was opened. And this is where Heller Shoes is located, in, as you can see in the picture. Uh, after that, the Apollo opened on Upper Wyndham Street in 1917, across the street from the Wellington Hotel. And then the Regent Theatre opened uh, at 44 Macdonnell Street, uh, and that was to the left of the Regent Hotel. And then in early 1922, the owner of the Apollo opened a larger movie theatre called The Castle, and it was located on the site of the American Hotel at 164 Wyndham Street. And it ran successfully until the building was destroyed by fire in 1928. Uh, then the next theater to open was the Royal Theater, which was at 87 Macdonnell Street. And you'll see a picture of it here. Uh, and it opened in the recently closed Bell Piano and Organ Factory. Uh, and the claim to fame of this, the Royal Theater, was that it had the first talking pictures uh, in Guelph were shown here. Uh, then, right across the street from where I am, the Palace Theater opened at 106 Macdonnell Street. And this is where the Penfield Carriage Works were located. Uh, the palace closed down in 1980 uh, when the Guelph Eaton Center was taking shape. Uh, and the last of the big screen downtown movie theaters was the Odeon, which was built on the site of the burned out Castle Theater on Wyndham Street. And it was right beside the location of the Royal Opera House. These last two downtown theaters were around when I was young. Uh, and I do remember seeing Dr. Doolittle at the palace when I was eight or nine years old. And, and I do remember nervously taking a first date to the Odeon Theater 
right behind me when I was in high school. And we saw, I remember seeing Raiders of the Lost Ark on that date. The Odeon closed down to become a concert and dance venue known as Club Denim. And then it became the Guelph Concert Theater, uh, which it is now. Uh, and the only remaining downtown movie theater was on the second floor of the bookshelf on Quebec Street. Uh, the big theaters left downtown and moved to the outskirts of the city. Um, we had the Three Star Cinema at the corner of the Hanlon and Woodlawn Road. And there are still uh, two Galaxy Odeon theaters, one at the south end and one at the north end of Guelph. Uh, even though many downtown theaters had closed, there was still a big screen in town on Speedville Avenue where the Speedville Shopping Plaza is located. The Guelph Drive-In Theater was located here in 1951 and operated for about 10 years until the city started to grow around it, as you can see in the picture. But we still have a drive-in theater close by. The Gem Drive-In Theater was built in 1955 by Charles Gemmett. Uh, and this was on the outskirts of town on Jones Baseline. And it was sold to Premier Operating Systems in the late 1960s. And it's now known as the Mustang Drive-In. And it's one of the only about 50 drive-in theaters left in Canada. And it's still a very popular place to watch a movie on a summer evening. With many options for movies over the years, there is still a need for live theater. The Guelph Little Theater had been active since 1935, but they didn't have a permanent home until actually 1967, when they purchased and moved into the former Salvation Army Citadel building on Dublin Street. You can see a picture of it here. This was their permanent home until fire destroyed the theater in 1993. And then the theater was homeless until 1996 when they moved into their current home at uh, 176 Morris Street. And this move was great for the Guelph Little Theater. It put the theater on a very strong footing with award-winning performances and a really amazing theater to work out of. And ever since the closing of the Opera House and its demolition in 1953, there had been a lack of a large permanent performing arts center. And it did take a while, but by the 1990s, there was support going to build one. Uh, buoyed by Mayor John Council, uh, Guelph citizens and local corporations proposed a $12 million project would move forward despite very vocal opposition towards it. Initially the plan was to incorporate the unused 1882 speed skating rink into the design and it was right here beside where I'm speaking. Uh, but when a fire destroyed that uh, building, uh, there, a whole brand new building was needed. And so designed by a Toronto firm of Moriyama and Tashima, the River Run opened in 1997 at a cost of $15 million, so a little bit over a budget, our original budget. Uh, so now we have a performance venue worthy of the citizens of Guelph with local, national and international performances gracing the stage. Uh, and each year there are over 400 events on their two stages that thousands of people get to experience. Uh, and 2022 was the 25th anniversary of the River Run Center. And I just want to say congratulations to all of the amazing staff and volunteers over the years for making the River Run such an essential part of Guelph. And although ticket prices at the River Run have gone up a little bit since the days of 25 cent ticket at the Royal Opera House, I'm sure the ancient order of the United Workmen would be very impressed with our Performing Arts Centre. And I just want to say if, if anyone has any memories or stories uh, from the movies or performances in Guelph, please share them in the comments section.